Today with us is Neil Davies, who co-authored the book Biocode. Uh, the living world runs on genomic software. Genomes can now be sequenced rapidly and increasingly cheaply. The genomes of large numbers of organisms from mammals to microbes have been mapped. Getting your genome sequenced is becoming affordable for many. The ability to read DNA has changed how we view ourselves and understand our place in nature. So this is a great book to get into the meaning and uses and all of the new advances uh, in genomic science. It was written by Don Field, Senior Research Fellow at Oxford E Research Center, and by our guest today, Neil Davies, Executive Director of the UC Berkeley Gump South Pacific Research Station. Neil Davies lives on Morea, the sister island to Tahiti in French Polynesia. He's the lead principal investigator of the Morea Barcode Project, a five million effort to sequence DNA barcode on all non-microbial species on the island. Both are research associates of the Biodiversity Institute of Oxford, where they are using their complementary experiences to co-found the International Genomic Observations Network. They have published uh, between them more than 140 scientific articles, including in science, nature, nature genetics, nature biotechnology, nature methods, and PNAS. PNAS stands for? Institute National Academy of Sciences. <laughs> okay, I didn't know that. And uh, they have both uh, research interests in evolution, populational genetics, genomics, uh, metagenomics, DNA barcoding, bioinformatics, biodiversity, and data sharing. Please join me in welcoming Neil Davis to Google today. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you very much, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, just to talk a little bit about our work. Uh, was to talk about this, this, this book, uh, which we'll cover, which is really, um, if anything, it's a, a homage to, to DNA, uh, a remarkable, a truly remarkable molecule. Um, obviously, since uh, the origin of, of the universe uh, and then the Earth, DNA appeared, as far as we know, for the first time uh, on this planet about four billion years ago, and eventually led to us, and has had many consequences and will continue to have uh, a lot of consequences. We can see what this molecule has done. We humans have seen it from outer space. Looking back, that is the, the phenotype, the expression of, of this molecule, because the Earth is really fashioned to a large extent by the activity that resulted from DNA. Initially from, from again, as far as we know, one single molecule that miraculously appeared on, on Earth about four billion years ago. And we, we represent a continuous family descended from that molecule and the first cell. <clears throat> and then more recently to our little tiny slither of time here in modern days, uh, covering this sort of 300 year period, uh, back in 1769, when people like Captain Cook was out exploring the, the planet and the first uh, coordinated scientific global mission occurred. Uh, back then to observe the transit of Venus. A uh, hundred years later, DNA was first recognized. A um, hundred years after that, DNA had got to the moon, <laughs> thanks to us, <laughs> or it took us to the moon, we took it to the moon. Uh, and a hundred years from now, we're, we're certainly already in the Anthropocene in that we, DNA through us, is really changing the world in, in a major way. And we don't quite know what 2069 is gonna look like, uh, and that's part of what I'm going to address in this uh, presentation. But it, it's based, obviously, our, there's lots of technologies that are evolving, but our particular focus here is the, the truly spectacular uh, advances of, of genomic technologies, uh, which, of course, go along with the plummeting price uh, of what it costs now to read uh, DNA sequences. Uh, so you've probably all seen these kinds of graphs before based on, on Moore's law and uh, genomic sequencing, which really obviously derives largely from the advances in computing in the first place, which made, has made this possible, uh, shows that the cost of getting your genome sequenced you know, is heading down to $1,000 and, and soon uh, below that. And the consequences of that for humans, we're gonna be sequencing ourselves 
uh, many times over probably, and you know, some projections of how many human genomes may be sequenced by 2024 are, are in the billions. So again, this is the usual exponential growth in, in technology. But what are the impacts of this going to be on us, on our personal health? But also because DNA is, is universal, it's everything living as far as we know has DNA, and it's a standardized code, it's the same code. So whatever was developed to read our genomes works in everything else. So we're able to leverage the advances driven primarily by medicine, and we can read genomes now in every other species on Earth. And that's, that's really my personal interest is, of course, my interest in the health of humans <laughs> too, but also what about all the other species, of which, of course, we humans depend upon. So our ability to read DNA has advanced massively, but including up to the point now where we can start to write that code as well. Uh, and this <laughs> is in many ways an even bigger uh, shift. You know, we can understand, we can see what nature has done, but, but now we have this uh, sort of godlike uh, capacity where we can actually potentially create life, we can cer certainly modify it. Um, and that's the first time in four billion years that anyone else has been shaping our, our biological future. So this is the first time we can potentially start a new tree of life synthetically, uh, which would be the first time in four billion years. And in the universe, as far as we know, the only, the only other time that that's been possible. So that, that should at least give us a little pause for thought about the consequences of that philosophically as well as uh, practically. <clears throat> so DNA is sort of everywhere now. You read about DNA all the time. Uh, and, it, and it has all kinds of benefits and impacts of, of what we can do uh, with this, this newfound capacity. So here's just a, uh, uh, several articles showing some of the applications of DNA sequencing technologies, and they're, they're obviously far beyond uh, medicine. Uh, Dornfield, uh, if you're interested, I'll follow a, a blog here, keeps, keeps up to date on some of these advances from across these uh, broad range of applications. So I encourage you to have a look at that, at her blog there. But today I'm going to talk more about, specifically about biodiversity genomics and some of the work that I'm personally more involved in, uh, and particularly how we take this understanding of genomics, apply it to other species and ultimately to ecosystems to really start to build a computational model of place. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Uh, essentially, we want to build avatars, not just of ourselves, but of the places we live in, so we can perform some of the scientific experiments that we need to be able to do if we're going to understand how to manage our ecosystems in the future. But of course, we can't do them in the real world uh, because of temporal and ethical and other concerns. So we really have to do them in silico. It's our only option. Like global climate modeling, you know, we, we have to rely on computer models because we only have one Earth to, to experiment on. <clears throat> so. The, the Earth, as I think Carl Sagan described it, a pale blue dot in the, in, the, in the darkness of space. And it is our island home. You know, and you, when we could look at it, we see this is an island, and we really need to take care of the island we live on. Uh, this, this view on, on Google Earth, so I'm happy to be here, <laughs> uh, is centered on Oxford, which, which is where I'm originally from. And, uh, <coughs> but I moved in 2000 to Tahiti in French Polynesia, and again, <laughs> and really this, I have to say, you know, Google does fantastic things, and Google Earth is, everyone says the maps and seeing things changes your perspective. I, I had no idea where I was living until I played with Google Earth, and I was just thinking, oh, it's going to be fun to see where we are. I knew I was in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, but I didn't, I had no idea quite how big the Pacific Ocean was, and, and I think maybe some, someone here can test this, you know, what view, if you sent to Google Earth, where do you see the most ocean? This is centered on Morea. I suspect it's pretty close. I don't know exactly what the point is. Uh, I was in, as an anecdote, I was in Hawaii where I lived prior to moving to Tahiti, um, but I went back there a few months ago and I was in a taxi and the taxi driver said, uh, oh, where are you from? I said, well, I live in Tahiti. He said, oh, wow, you live in the middle of the ocean, huh? <laughs> hmm, I was on Oahu, which <laughs> for most people is, is pretty much in the middle of the ocean. Um, Anyhow, so the Pacific, as recently described in The Economist, is a blank uh, on the map, uh, except for some little islands. Um, but it's bigger than the world's entire landmass. So the Pacific is a pretty significant place, 
even though it's true there's, for humans, it's been largely a blank, at least for most humans. Um, but it is, uh, the island of Moray, where, where the research station is located, is part of French Polynesia, which is an overseas territory, uh, a country of France. Uh, it has five million square kilometers of exclusive economic zone. So it's a big, a big uh, footprint on the earth that's uh, controlled there by French Polynesia. <coughs> the island of Moray is, is unusual in that it has two uh, international research stations located on it, uh, UC Berkeley, uh, also the French uh, CNRS Apache uh, National Lab on the same island. So here we are located on the north shore uh, of, of Moray. And we formed a, a partnership along with a number of other institutions to really try and study this island in, in a lot of detail. Um, so the Creob, the French lab has been there since 1971, which um, primarily studying coral reefs, which makes these coral reefs probably the longest studied uh, anywhere in the world con continuously. Uh, the Berkeley station was established in 1985, so we're celebrating our 30 years. Uh, it was donated by a Mr. Richard Gump, who was from San Francisco, Gump's department store. You may have seen it. And we've had a lot of support from Gordon Moore and the Moore, Gordon and Moore, uh, Betty Moore Foundation uh, since then, in, including building the laboratories and funding some of the research programs I'll talk about. <coughs> Finally, we now have a, another, just off the coast of Morea is a small atoll, which used to be owned by Marlon Brando and is currently owned by the Brando Estate. And there we have a partnership with an eco-resort uh, and we have a, a small research station on this atoll. So we have a high island and an atoll very close to one another. So two very exceptional uh, research, natural research laboratories for work. So I'm going to just give a little bit of context on, on these islands because I'm going to come back to them uh, later in the talk. But as I say, there's, we have this, this scale of complexity from a small private island with a couple hundred people on it to Morea, 17,000 people, and it's a populated place uh, with agriculture and fisheries and everything else that a, a, a society has. Uh, and then next door is Tahiti, which is almost 200,000 people and a, a jump up in, in complexity. The other interesting thing uh, scientifically to know about these islands, and this, this applies similarly to the Hawaiian islands, they're on hotspot archipelagos. So you have the younger island down here in the south, and as the Pacific plate moves up to the northwest, the islands move off the hotspot, and so they get older. So Morea is a little bit older than Tahiti. Tahiti is the youngest island still close to the hotspot. Uh, Bora Bora up there in the northwest is a much older island. So we have this great uh, time machine, really, to move back and forth in time. Say, so what would Tahiti look like in a few million years? Well, we can go up the island chain and see that. And Hawaii is, is a similar case. So it's truly remarkable for people studying evolutionary e ecology. You know, we don't have a time ship, and we're working on these kinds of time scales. Our processes take that long. So it's very hard for us to do any experimentation, but here provides a, a nice comparative uh, setup. You couldn't really ask for better. So that's Morea today. You know, Morea, in three million years, is going to look something like that, which is, in fact, Bora Bora. And in five million years, it'll look something like this, an, an atoll. The other important part is the natural system for study is that we are at this end of a, a natural biodiversity gradient. So the highest biodiversity in the world is out in Southeast Asia. This is marine and terrestrial. As you come across the South Pacific, there's a gradual attenuation in biodiversity. Uh, interesting, that also applies to human culture. You know, there's 900 or so languages in Papua New Guinea. Once you get out to Eastern Polynesia, there's one clade, one family of people, the Polynesians, who've spread out to 50 different ethnographically described societies from Easter Island, New Zealand, up to Hawaii uh, and Tahiti in the middle. So it's one monophyletic group that, that's out here. So lo low cultural diversity compared to the, the West. And these systems have gone through the evolution that a lot of societies have around the world. Uh, but the difference is here that epochs are very clearly demarcated. So the island arose in the middle of, of the ocean. There was no one there. All the plants and animals had to colonize that island. So there was a, a pre-human period. And then these were the last places on Earth to be colonized by humans. Uh, Polynesians arriving about 1,500 years ago. So it's a relatively very recent. Of course, when Polynesians arrived, that was a huge impact. They came with plants and other animals and insects and completely led to a complete overhaul uh, collapse of the system and then a reformulation of 
of, of a new ecological system. So it's an example of complex system cycles. And then that reached some kind of stability, at least over the, call it the thousand years or so of Polynesians there until, and that this we know to the day, until the first European explorers arrived in, in Tahiti in, in uh, 1767. And that was also a, a massive over, of upheaval of the system, mainly, at least for the human part, is due to introductions of new biodiversity, new genomes, uh, in the form of uh, infectious diseases, which led to a crash in the population. <clears throat> and then the fourth one is really when the, the, the islands were connected to the modern world, and that started in around the 1960s with the first air, international airport, and, and mainly that was initiated through nuclear testing that the French uh, were carrying out at that time. So each of these phases really is marked by a great increase in, in uh, connectivity, and these islands became less, less of islands. And of course today, the big change is we may be in the fifth, fifth epoch, which is driven by the internet. So a few years ago, French Polynesia laid a submarine cable between Tahiti and Hawaii for the first time. So now there's fiber optic connection to the Hawaiian Islands and of course from Hawaii to the mainland. And so we have now these two archipelagos either side of the equator connected on a backbone uh, of fiber optic, which is having social consequences, but for us, scientifically, this is a great thing. So now we're connected to the rest of the world and we can really study these systems and take full advantage of supercomputer capacities on mainland and, and instantaneous communications, high bandwidth. <clears throat> so I'm gonna talk a little more detail now about biodiversity specifically um, and how it relates to ecosystem services and genomics. So uh, this is a new panel You've probably all heard of the IPCC for Climate Change Intergovernmental uh, Panel on Climate Change. This is a new one with a similar kind of goal, but focusing on biodiversity. Because we, we're, we're facing a twin crisis. We have climate change caused by carbon emissions, greenhouse, greenhouse gases, but we also are losing biodiversity at a dramatic rate. Um, and that's, I think not many people argue that that's due to humans. <laughs> There's, uh, we, we all know that human activity obviously kills things, sometimes deliberately, uh, but through land use change and others, cl clearly we're reducing biodiversity ourselves. Um, and that is in some ways much more worrying because that truly is irreversible. Once it's gone, we can't get it back. Okay. So um, at the research station in Moray, we have conferences on different things too, and, and we, including astronomy. And one of the interesting things I, I learned from a recent astronomy conference was talking about the, the dark energy. A lot of that is not really known, this 70% 70, 70 or so of what dark energy is. Um, but astronomy, you know, physicists have this really great clarity of, of view and, and are far ahead of us in biodiversity science because you know, that's how it looks to us. The world, we, we have about 1.2 million species that are cataloged, and that's pretty good. But really, we're seeing things incredibly fuzzily because the, the vast majority of species on Earth are, are dark. Uh, we, have, we know they're there, but we have no idea uh, what they are exactly. Um, so 86% of eukaryotic, so the animals and plant species, we know or we estimate are still out there waiting to be just, just described, just listed. Um, and at the current rate, that's gonna take many, 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 many years, decades, you know, about 20,000 species a year. So we're, we're not even getting close to challenging this problem. Um, and that's really literally the tip of the iceberg because those are just the animals and plants and eukaryotic larger species. You know, half of the biomass on Earth are microbial and who knows how many species of, of microbes there are. And of course, as we're learning now through, through genomic, metagenomic uh, techniques, we humans are largely microbial in some estimates. Obviously by mass, we're mainly human. We're the foundation species, but we're, we're a walking ecosystem. And uh, you know, only one in a hundred of our cells of our bodies are human, uh, and even fewer of our genes in our bodies are, are the human genes. So this kind of, uh, does that change the way we think about ourselves? Well, we're still, you know, I'm still who, who I am, still a human, but <laughs> are the microbes part of me too? Yeah, they are. Uh, does that change the way I think about myself? 
I'm not sure yet. <laughs> Still thinking about it, but 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 definitely, if we want to understand our health, we need to understand the ecological health of our communities, and that's one of the main messages we try and get across in the book. I think we have to think that we are we're all ecosystems now, and we need ecosystem thinking, uh, which medicine hasn't really had to deal with in the past. Um, so the idea that we can study biodiversity on Earth, which is is undoubtedly vitally important to the health of the planet and ourselves. You know, just studying this little bit, the vertebrates and the plants, is, <laughs> is, is limited. Or as Bob Robbins, who authored his slides, you know, it's wrong. We, we really have to look at the whole, the whole, because a lot of the important processes that are happening in, on, on the planet are being carried out by these microbes, including the processes happening inside us. Fortunately, of course, Seems like we're going to, we've got an overwhelming task, but technology comes to our aid here, and the, the exponential increase in, in the DNA technologies particularly. <clears throat> what that's meaning is that this challenge of documenting, at least in the first phase, and then, and then understanding what all this biodiversity is doing before it disappears, is possible now, or at least we can hope to get there, thanks to genomics. And, and as I said before, because DNA is a universal code, Thank God, you know, if DNA wasn't, and we had to do uh, the equivalent of the human genome project for every species, we'd be toast. I mean, there's no way we're gonna get funding to do that for every species, right? Um, but, but it was done for the humans, and now we can apply that everywhere else. So we're really able to piggyback on that, and it's not a coincidence, of course, it's because it is the standard code, because life did only evolve once. So we are truly all related. Uh, and that's what giving us these new tools. We're not quite at the point where you can just squash something on on your smartphone and, and you get back all the information, but we're, we're getting close, closer. Uh, an initiative here of identifying one standard gene region that if we sequence them for a representative species, we have a species name, we can use that tag as the identifier for any bit of biomaterial. If you have the material, you can sequence it very cheaply, possibly even just squash it on, on your phone one day, reference the database, and get back what, what that species is. So this is the barcode concept. The species are barcoded, but their names, again, very conveniently for us, are written inside them. Our genomes are our names, they're our full names, and they're written in every single cell, so we only have to have, any, you know, as long as you have a cell, we can identify what the species is. So it couldn't have been any easier for taxonomists in some ways. You know, the answer is, is there, and we're already pre-labeled in all of our cells. <coughs> So the technology is getting better, but there's, there are some uncompressible, or they seem to be uncompressible costs. So unfortunately, DNA technology is, is very advanced, but we can't read it from satellites. So to do things at a high scale, we still have to physically go out and get a piece of material, biomaterial. And you know, these are just places when you try and do that from anywhere, that's expensive. It's just the physical, how do you catch these things? And catching them isn't easy. They evolve to avoid us, generally. So, so that's an uncompressible cost. So it's still expensive to do this, even if the sequencing and, and the informatics and processing get to be very, very cheap. So we could potentially sequence every species on Earth. Uh, it's going to take us a long time, mainly at least because of those collecting costs. So one thing we're trying to do is fast forward to the future of what would it look like if we did know all of our biodiversity. We can't do that for the whole planet or even a country, but we can potentially do it for a small island uh, model systems. As we've done at the level of organisms with model species, like the fruit fly or, or the mouse, we've, we've really thrown the kitchen sink at those species to understand how they function. So medicine, that, that approach has been incredibly powerful. We've studied both very simple species and e extremely complex ones, us, and we've learned a lot uh, from studying both of those at the same time in a lot of detail. So one thing we're arguing for uh, and promoting in this book as well is to take that model from medicine and apply it at the ecosystem and the social ecosystem scale uh, in these natural laboratories. And it's really taking the, the systems approach that's been developed in, in biology, systems biology for medicine, this sort of P4 approach, you know, which is uh, predictive, preventative, um, participatory, and apply that to sustainability. Um, we have to, just in personalizing it, the, the fourth P, for ourselves, we need, everyone's different, and we wanna 
understand ourselves at the individual level in order to predict and then prevent uh, disease as it comes along. But to understand ourselves, we also have to share, it has to be participatory, because I might have a sequence of my genome, but I can't say too much about what that will do unless I can compare it with others. So we have to participate with each other and get involved in, in the science ourselves. And that's the same at the ecosystem scale. Every ecosystem is completely unique and different, but it shares common commonalities with others. So we need to participate, share, but also personalize and, and develop a predictive approach, which is very in, intensive. Um, so how do, we, how do we go about doing this? So we're proposing this, this uh, sustainability science approach, uh, which explicitly uh, models itself on what's been done in, in medicine. Uh, of course, we're having these big impacts on the planet. This isn't quite what it looks like outside, but it probably will do in a couple of hours. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, this, we're having a big impact. Um, and we can see that everywhere. So this is a Pacific island, so very far away from that kind of traffic, although Honolulu has a lot of traffic too. But even out in the middle of, uh, of the Pacific, you know, we can pick up this signal. Of course, the, the famous uh, observations from, from Mauna Loa on the concentration of carbon dioxide. You can, you can see the planet breathing uh, here. But it's, it's going up. So we're having impacts even in these most remote islands, uh, which is showing that through global change, there's nowhere. Nowhere is pristine anymore. Every, everywhere is impacted by human activities. So whereas in the past, we could manage things locally and not have to worry about what everyone else was doing, now, even if you're living out where I live now, you, you have to worry about what everyone else is doing. Because even if you're perfectly managing your system, you're being driven by outside, from outside forces which, to which you have to respond. So we need uh, a sustainability science that <coughs> is theoretically interesting and challenging, but is also uh, very applied. It needs to be actionable. We need to come up with uh, recommendations for how do we manage, how do we adapt to, to change, and how do we mitigate uh, the changes if that's possible. And that has to happen at all these different scales. Um, you know, at the global scale, certainly. Uh, unfortunately, at the global scale, we have limited governance capacity. Uh, at national scales, where we have a lot more levers to, to pull, but also right down to, you know, what people really care about is what's happening in your backyard. How's, how's this impacting me? Which is why all politics is local, but that's also true of a lot of these processes. They, they're happening at a local scale, albeit driven by global processes. So the systems approach needs to be both plan it down. You know, for example, here we have to look at how is the ocean becoming more acidic. So that's happening worldwide. It's a worldwide phenomenon driven by worldwide processes. Uh, but if we want to understand how the natural world and our societies are going to respond, we need to look at that more locally, indeed, even to the genome. So for example, in corals, if we want to know what's going to happen to corals because of ocean acidification, we have to look at the calcification process. How does that work? What genes are involved? Do the corals have any uh, genetic variation that enables them to respond to different levels of acidification and continue to grow? Right? But that we have to understand at the genome scale and all the scales in between. So it's a, it is the, the massive challenge. We have to go from here, molecule, genome particularly, up all the way to the planet um, and understand how these things all, all interact. I mentioned the astronomers, so these, this is pretty big, but we probably don't need to do too much astronomy necessarily, although the planets certainly are, interest, are, are impacting us as well. Uh, and do we need to go to subatomic particles? I, I don't know, probably not, but still, that leaves us with a, a vast swathe uh, to study. <clears throat> so at the global scale, there, there are initiatives, this is the, the global, uh, Group on Earth observations, trying to coordinate how we observe the planet including biodiversity, uh, uh, weather patterns, climate, physical processes. And at the genomic level, we've launched a genomic observatories network, uh, which is uh, partly under GEO, uh, and applying standards for how we do this so we can actually compare the data we're, that we're observing in the field. Because even though we can get sequences, and there are lots and lots of sequences now in GenBank, What's crucial to take advantage of those sequences is the context, the information about where those sequences came from. So 
I mean, a lot of them initially didn't even have the time and place. And there's very little we can do with, it, uh, with those, those types of sequence without those data. And then there's all kinds of other contextual data that we need to have if we're going to make those sequences useful. So because there is a cost to collecting the sequences, and there's a cost to treat, analyzing them, and all of the contextual data, there's much more value if they, if they have a rich context. We want to study these, uh, uh, do focus this uh, sequencing effort in places that are very well studied across all levels. Right? And, and it has to be focused because it's expensive to do this at, at, at high density. So th this is an example from our site, but this is part of a network. Uh, the National Science Foundation of the United States funds long-term ecological research sites, which are you know, 25 sites funded by the NSF, which are a focused effort on those places over decades. So places like that is where we can focus these, uh, our genomic observations, where we know then they'll be embedded in this very, very rich context. And our challenge, let's flick through those, our challenge is how to integrate across all of these different data sets to address specific processes. So I mentioned we've, there are a number of these sites around the world, and we've formed this network trying to work together. The genomic technologies are evolving so fast. You have to, there's a lot of the participatory part, sharing what works, what doesn't work. Because um, we're building a genomic observatory, layering it into studies that give it the historical context. How do we get to this point today? So we need the archaeological, paleoecological work. Um, the environmental observatory, what's the environmental context of those sequences, ecological, the, the classical part of counting birds and fish and butterflies, but also social. What, what are humans doing in that system? As I said before, we can't ignore humans anymore in natural systems. We're, we're key drivers of those systems. <clears throat> so we have to layer these, these genomic observations at this various level. And these observatories could be at the scale of single you know, sometimes there are a buoy that's intensively monitored, just a point, which is obviously a very open system, an ecosystem, not really, maybe. People, you know, we're, we're monitoring our microbiome. So in a sense, some of us, some of the best studied people are becoming genomic observatories, looking at how their microbiome and how their genome changes uh, during their lifetime. So that's a form of genomic observatory. There's work going on in buildings, like a hospital, studying from scratch as the hospital's built. How is it colonized by different microbes over time? How does that affect the patients? Uh, forests are being studied, whole river, basins, uh, up to you know, complete land masses, small ones, uh, larger ones, um, and then ultimately the planet. So one of the first uh, actions of this, you know, these are both making genomic observations at a very local scale to address local questions, but also globally we can start to coordinate those and. and fashion uh, a global observatory. And we did this uh, under a project called Ocean Sampling Day, which was an attempt to, can we task the world to make a coordinated genomic observation using the same protocols at the same time on the same day? <laughs> you know, like you would if you had a, a telescope or something, you really want, oh, we want to run this experiment, can we do this? So the, we did it uh, last year, 180 sites around the world went out and did exactly the same thing on the same time. You know, and it was from Antarctica to the tropics in all these kind of different sort of some conditions. And it was done remarkably cheaply, you know, on a shoestring, basically, because we could leverage all of these places that have boats, that have people, that have labs, that are already out there. They just need coordination, and we can go and start doing the same thing. Just, I say, because it's, it's a lot of work, but it's, the infrastructure exists. If we want to tool it up for something, we, we can use it. So the question is, what would be what we do with this capacity that we have. I mean, it's just an emerging capacity, uh, which we're realizing for the first time we, we have the ability to apply. <clears throat> so now I'll switch a little bit to how we use genomics at, at these uh, places and following our roadmap here from systems biology. If we want to understand a, a system from the genome up, you know, one of the first things you need to do is what's in the system, what are the parts? As I mentioned before, for biodiversity, that's a real challenge because we don't, we have no idea. It's like you're trying to study the ca a car engine and you've only got, you know, a bit of the front headlight and, and the rear view mirror and you're trying to figure out well, how this car operates. 
so that's a, a big limitation. And we had this project, the, which was uh, the biocode project, uh, which started on Morea, the goal of which was to sequence one example, at least, of every species of animal, plant, and fungi as possible from the entire system, from the coral reefs around 150 meters down to 1,200 meters up on the mountaintop. This was funded by the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation and involved <coughs> a, a, many, many scientists from a lot of institutions around the world, led, led by the ones uh, listed here. But then collecting di diversity, biodiversity is messy. <laughs> it's, there's a reason why it's called biodiversity. It's diverse. It's uh, all kinds of variation. So out there, it's very variable. And the collection methods, you need specialists who, who know how to go and catch these critters. Uh, you know, they can be involved going up at night to the mountaintops or, or deep down on the, you know, diving down to 150 meters on the outside, outer slope of the reefs. So that's, that's the, the cost part. Uh, it's very, and then you collect all of these organisms. They come back to the lab and they look something like this. <laughs> You know, this explosion of tubes and taking digital photographs of everything, trying to link the photographs to make sure it all stays linked to the, the specimen in the tube, um, which will eventually lead to a, a DNA sequence. Of course, the, the sequencing was being done mainly at the Smithsonian in Washington, so those sequences get appended later to these data, all the while retaining all of the contextual information about where that sample came from in the, in the natural world. Uh, so it's a complete explosion of data uh, carried out by different people coming from different times, from different institutions, from different countries. Uh, it, most of the workflow, though, starts with this single collecting event. It has to be isolated from nature. And everything really hangs off that. But even before that, you need to get a permit. <laughs> Genetic resources these days are valuable, and they're reg increasingly regulated. So that's, that's a, a part that can't be forgotten. But then it generates from that one event, there's this cascade as you get many specimens. Those are photographed. They get subsampled into different tubes, sent off to different labs, and sequenced. And then you try and, you know, then they get all those data get stored in different places around the world. And some of those are physical specimens, so, and many of them are, are digital data items. So, how do we keep track of all these and keep them all linked together? And they're all going to different places. So I'm not, I'm not going to go into that because, but that's a informatics challenge that is at once seems quite simple, and it is. The technologies all exist. It's more of a sociological challenge because it's very, very hard to enforce this. So we can actually reconstitute the data, in this case, about this island. It's, very, it's, a, it's a massive challenge. And it, it really involves applying unique identifiers to all of these objects, which, again, sounds simple, but in reality, it's very hard to make happen. <clears throat> Having done that, if you've got all the, your list of parts, you know, that's just the first step. How are they interacting with each other? That's really what's interesting. And that's, that's kind of the exciting part uh, for us as ecologists, at least. Um, and that's pivoting now, as, as Chris Meyer, who directed this project, the Smithsonian calls it. Uh, we're going from an inventory, and which is going out finding things and grinding them up and sequencing them, to an approach which is more observatory over time. We've got the reference database. Now, we actually go into reverse. We grind them up. And then we sequence them, blast them against our reference database, and see what we got. This we can do at high volume. So we're trying to yank this science into a science that's high throughput, which is really what, what revolutionized uh, biology, cellular molecular biology, is the ability to get to high throughput data generation. Ecology is still painfully slow. It's hard. But we're getting to the point with these new technologies where we can, we have a reference database now. We have these DNA tags. They're like the license plates on your car, right? So now, now what we need to decide is, well, where do we put the toll booths to read these license plates? And that's an ecological question. How do we understand who's where in the system? Who are they, who are they with? Uh, and potentially, who are they eating? So we can get at things like the food webs, because we can look in the guts. We can look at plankton trawls, because we can just grind things up and blast it, sequence and blast it. And that, that part's pretty easy. So it can be done at high throughput. And looking at these interactions, so for example, if now we can get these, these DNA tags. We can look at gut contents. It gives us a whole new view. So that some of this work Chris Meyer did with, with um, other partners shown here. <coughs> Just as a test, we had this one cubic foot, which uh, National Geographic photographer Dave, David Litschwager photographed, which actually I think some of this, we, we, there was a display here a couple of years back. But um, 
can we build a food web of all of these individuals that he found in this one cubic foot on, on the coral reef of Morea? And so they did that. You know, so this is what, what we think all of those different individuals, might, how they might relate to each other. You can collapse that down and say, well, some species eat the same thing. So we'll just collapse that into one node. makes it easier to, to, um, to study, for one thing. But you know, we think they're doing the same thing. <clears throat> Here are two, two species of fish that were collapsed into one of those nodes. And then we can start to test that. So we take these guts from these fish, uh, or rather this team did, look at what's in those guts. You know, obviously, they're hard to identify visually, so the genetics is really the only way to get at it. But what we see here is that these two fish actually eat completely different things, or at least those individuals have. So we were wrong. Just because they look like the same fish hanging out in the same place, probably eat the same thing, they seem to be much more specialized than we thought. And we can do the same thing at the scale, you know, for birds and other organisms. So we start to build up the interactome, all the interactions of this system. Uh, in with evidence, uh, or at least relatively direct evidence, if it's found in the gut of something. <clears throat> and this is sort of part of a broader revolution, I would say, in, in the way we're looking at ecosystems. And, and this is work largely drawing on Tom Whitlam's group, uh, who work on cottonwoods out in uh, Arizona. And what they've found is that the genotype of a foundation species like a tree the variation within the species among individuals, the genetic variation, turns out to be incredibly important for ecosystem scale uh, functions. So treating two species as if they're doing the same thing in the ecosystem, we're learning is probably a dangerous thing to do. But even saying that species is all the same is also <laughs> dangerous. So when he, Tom and colleagues looked at these trees, they found, for example, that differences in elevation of 100 meters or so can have different genotypes of tree, which when you put them in a common garden, which is what you know, forestry agronomists have been doing for, for decades, but not really focusing on natural systems. When they put them in natural, uh, common gardens, whoa, the ones that are 100 meters higher don't do so well. And that has all kinds of knock-on effects also. This tree that they've, Whittam's group found that the tree also has a characteristic set of insects and bacteria and fungi and even birds that start to that are linked to the genotype of the tree. So trees of the same species with different genotypes have different communities. So it's sort of an extended phenotype of the, of the tree and a community level uh, genomics. <clears throat> so understanding the genomic variation within species can be crucially important, particularly if they're foundation species, like trees, on which a lot of other things depend. And those kinds of the, the trees are have different variability at elevations. That's reflecting environmental adaptation. So what they've shown, too, is that if you replant trees in restoration projects, but you're planting the wrong genotype, and often we try and plant what's local, because you know, we're scared of invasive species, and we always plant the local type of tree here, locally, because that's, that's good. Uh, that could be very bad. <laughs> it could be good in, in stable world, but in a world of rapid environmental change, you spend millions and millions of dollars replanting your forest. 20 years time, those trees won't survive there anymore because they're the wrong genotype. You should have gone further south, picked up ones you know, 1,000 kilometers further south. Those, that genotype will respond to the future climate in, in your locality. But for that, we need to have a sophisticated understanding of genomic variation, climate, and what's happening in the future climate. And some of these certain corals, it's likely to be the same. We're, finding, we're beginning you know, the trees the first genome uh, sequence for a tree was, was the cottonwood. That's why partly how Whitton's group were able to advance so rapidly. Also, it, on land, this is you know, traditionally done, uh, common garden approaches. Corals are, are the foundation species of coral reefs. And we're finding the variation among corals has similar, is likely to have similar kinds of consequences. So if we're going to really be able to preserve variation, we might have to think of things like assisted migration. You know, these species are not going to survive on their own if there's not enough genomic variation where they are, unless we introduce types that are able to, to survive. <clears throat> so I'm going to finish, uh, finish up here with a consideration of when we get finally down to this end, where we've got a lot of this other information, and now we're, we're able to start quantifying interactions and, and modeling them, and we really understand processes. So for the last 10 minutes or so, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. 
And what we're trying to do here is build a model or a set of models that, that simulate or describe as accurately as we can a, a whole ecosystem, including the humans in it, so a social ecological system ultimately. Um, <clears throat> so these com uh, computational models of complex entities exist. Uh, so we have them already for some, some things, the, the, the obvious one being the cell. So the cell is the foundation of biology. Uh, and we understand an awful lot about the cell now, up to the point where we have an, an avatar of bacterial cells. Um, and actually, we can even artificially synthesize the genome and potentially create a new species of bacteria, which has been done. And Craig Venter's group have, have done that, recoded and, and uh, relaunched a, a cell. The cell, you still need the cell, but we can artificially synthesize a new genome put it into a cell, boot the cell back up, and you've got a, a new species uh, created by humans. <laughs> um, it's still using, it's, it's inspired by biology, it's using, it's biological still, and it's still using a, a, a natural cell, but it's still, it, it's, that's a, a physical example of we can actually now understand things because we can build them. You know, if you can't build it, you don't understand it, as the saying goes. Well, we can start to build at least genomes of cells. Uh, we can also build them in the computer. So this was the first whole cell computational model. Uh, and that, you know, that set, what does that set up? I mean, in cells, of course, you have lots of cells in a laboratory. You can do lots of things with cells. Um, but still, it was considered potentially revolutionary to be able to have this, these at silico avatars of, of cells where things emerge from the model or from the, from the avatar that you didn't expect. And then you can go and look in the real world and say, hey, does that actually happen? And you know, so some of it becomes a, a discovery tool for finding out things uh, back in the real world. And so it was hailed partly as sort of a dawn of virtual cell biology. Uh, whether it'll actually supplant the need for wet lab uh, is probably it's doubtful, but, but it certainly uh, is enhancing it. So virtual cells, computational models of cells exist, and they're getting more and more sophisticated. And now that's including up to multi, small multicellular organisms. Um, so this is back in 2008, saying we need to move from the cell level up to uh, interactions um, and how communities function. And so in this paper, they were talking about how how organisms interact and move up to understanding ecosystems through these sort of network analysis approaches. But, you know, look at what they were calling an ecosystem. It was uh, something around your tooth. <laughs> it's uh, not necessarily the ecosystem we're talking about at, a, at our scale. But what it shows is we're really, we, we are all ecosystems, uh, whether it's our body, let's say buildings up to, up to the planet. Um, and specifically, the case of landscape scale, social ecological systems, we need to be able to deliver predictions, forecasts that policy can respond to if, if we're going to hope to maintain the health of our societies and our planet, just as we do at the scale of our bodies through medicine. So predicting the future, you know, this was in 1769 when Captain Cook came out and people went all the way around the world to look at the transit of Venus, and I won't go into details of that, but it was coordinated, it had to be done because the transit of Venus doesn't happen very often, every century or so. And you had to be there to observe it from different parts of the world uh, in order to estimate the distance between the Earth and the Sun. That was what it was being done for. <coughs> but they knew back then exactly when the next transit would be in, in 1769, so it was arranged you know, to go out there and observe it right at that time. So the prediction even then in physics, astronomy was, was, very, was very accurate. And the last transit of Venus was two years ago, I think. I'm going to write right. Yeah, two years ago. And we went out to the same spot in Tahiti <laughs> and stood there and you know, stood on the beach and waited for the transit of Venus along with thousands of other people who were there in this big you know, um, ceremony. And the last person to do that was Cook. <laughs> uh, 
so it was pretty remarkable. But also sitting there thinking, well, what if this doesn't happen? This would really shake up physics. I, kind of better. <laughs> I hope this happens. Uh, it would be embarrassing if it didn't. Uh, <laughs> but it, of course, it, it did. So physics is safe for a while. But um, <laughs> uh, interestingly, Captain, uh, anecdote because I like this, but Captain Cook sent out uh, jo Sir Joseph Banks, who was a future. This, this expedition was funded by the Royal Society from London. So it was. Uh, it was a scientific expedition, and he set up his observatory on TD, sent Banks, who was a botanist, over to Morea to observe it from Morea, just in case it was cloudy on Tahiti. So the first, and, and Banks was the first European to set foot on, on Morea. So the kind of nice for me is that the first European who arrived on Morea was there as a scientific mission to set up an observatory, and of course we're still doing that. And here's uh, Frank Murphy, our associate director at the station. We're standing right on the spot where we think uh, Banks, this is on Morea. This used to be, a, it's eroded now, but this was where he stood there to observe um, the transit of Venus. So physics is good, can predict things. Uh, biology, we, we can't predict it. We, we, we have general predictions, but we're certainly nothing like the accuracy of this. Um, but that's, uh, you know, that's, that's always going to be the case. It's, we're never going to get to that level of accuracy. But we need to make these forecasts, useful forecasts, at various scales. And so I'll finish with this, because this is the, you know, what we're trying to do now. We're trying to integrate all of these, the genomic level, all of the, the different sciences that we have, but focused on one system. How do we join those into an overarching model that simulates that system in, in a useful way? Ca can we do that? And this uh, project, the Island Digital League System Avatar Consortium, now has about 80 scientists from around the world, who are, including physicists and, and astronomers, who are trying to understand how we, would, how we would even set about doing this. We've had a number of workshops over the last year or so. And really, this is you know, relating to the, the book stream of using genomic inf information from cells up to the planet. How do we do that to ultimately to model the Earth? That's overwhelmingly complex, but you know, we're trying through these genomic observatory sites and, and Morea uh, in particular to at least get a handle on these. We only have to go, we still have to start at the molecule, but we only have to go to the island, which is a lot less than the planet. So we think, uh, hopefully that's a little more tractable. But once we can do that, we have to, we have to challenge, solve all of the same problems that we'd have to solve everywhere else in the world and, and including at the global scale. So it's a focus, yes, but it still has uh, global uh, ramifications. So I think I'll stop there. Uh, thank you very much. It certainly seems clear that someplace like Morea would be an ideal place to start an effort like this because it's relatively self-contained and relatively isolated. Uh, but you've cited a number of different kinds of factors. I mean, not counting the, you know, the things that happened when the humans first arrived and everything got completely screwed up, but just on an ongoing basis, there's the arrival of new plants and animals. Uh, there are environmental changes like temperature and acidity in the oceans and so forth. And then also, since you've excluded microbial, that's effectively a part of the environment too. And any of those three things are going to be, or all of them will be changing over time. Are those things happening on a long enough time scale that they won't interfere with the time scale of your, your work? Or alternatively, are there anything, is there anything you have to do to try to keep particularly the new plants and animals from arriving and disrupting you? Yeah, uh, yes. So I think yes to both questions. But the, no, of course, you're absolutely right. Uh, Morea is, being, is changing all the time, and we can't stop that. We absolutely have to look at the microbes. So I present we've done the survey of the large organisms because those were the easier ones to do first. But a lot of work is also being, is taking place at the microbial level. Uh, the ocean sampling day I mentioned, for example, was a, a microbial uh, survey of, of surface seawater looking at marine microbes. So there's, we need to expand that biocode project, the Morea biocode project, to include the microbial parts of the system. To do that, we're going to focus on foundation species because we, we can't do all the microbes. So as I mentioned, the trees. So how, how are trees, what's the genomic variation in trees? Because the Bioco project was a species level inventory. 
So we have to also look at population level variation among all of the different individuals on the island. So, so the, the inventory part is, is far from complete. You know, we've got a better handle than we have elsewhere, but we've got much, much more to do. And the next phase is we'll be looking at key foundation species, genomic variation within those species, and their microbial associates and, and the interaction between those. <clears throat> we can't stop. We, we, have to, we have the scale of the island, which we're trying to understand and model what's happening in, inside the island. But we have to take all of the external inputs, which at least we can measure, you know, because an island, we know what's outside and what's inside our system, are uh, the drivers from outside. We're there taking regional and global models and downscaling those and linking them to our local models. So we're not ignoring what's happening at the larger scale and, and different time scales, but having to integrate that with what's happening on the lo at the local scale. So it's, if, I, I didn't mean to imply that we're only doing the larger species and ignoring the microbes. And the, and the global changes we absolutely have to take into account. In fact, the predictive models are basically, can we predict what this island will look like in a few decades under likely scenarios of environmental change? That's one of the simulations we want to run. And under likely scenarios of policy change and, of course, the interaction between, between those two. So we're not trying to simulate every possible scenario. We're trying to simulate a, a small number of scenarios that are, are relevant and hopefully useful. Uh, quick question here. So what kind of collaborations are you looking to uh, establish? I, I heard that you're working with the Smithsonian uh, Oxford University. Is there any uh, other field that you would like people contact you and you know, like what's the best way to get in touch? And what is the thing that you know, like your institution can provide for these other institutions that may have you know, like a fruitful collaboration in the future? Yeah, so, so absolutely. So the, the consortium, the idea consortium is completely open <laughs> to, it, it, the idea is to make this system available to study remotely Right. We're trying to digitize the whole system, put it into supercomputers so it can be studied from remotely, but also connecting back to what observations need to happen on the real world. Because it's not a computer game. So we, we need to model what we think and generate these visualizations, simulations, and then validate those in our real world system. So it'll involve some work on the ground and people, teams on the ground doing this, uh, deployment of new sensors, satellite imagery in embedded network sensing. Obviously, the genomics has to be done, uh, at least the collections have to be done locally. And then the number of institutions involved, we have 20 institutions sort of uh, nodes in the Avatar Consortium at the moment. Uh, ETH Zurich was, was one of the founders, as you mentioned, Oxford, uh, the uh, French uh, CNRS lab. So it's, it's completely open to anyone who wants to, who wants to join, thinks they have something to contribute. and. Uh, it, it, it's also part of this is addressing the sociological problem I mentioned earlier of data sharing because the, the avatar is going to be open. Right? The idea is that everyone puts their data in there, not just the data, but the models and everything else will go into this infrastructure. So all of the experiments should be re reproducible so anyone else in the world can try them. You can actually pretend, you know, run new experiments if you can do those experiments virtually. Uh, and also t the, the avatar will help task us Hey, we're trying, to, we're trying to model this, and, but we don't have data on this aspect of your system. Can someone, you know, someone else, we really need that if somebody else could go out and you know, look at the physiology of this species of coral or whatever it might be. So it also helps identify opportunities. And we, we, we provide support physically because we have the labs in the field. Um, but really, this is a call for collaboration with anyone who's interested. Please thank Neil Davies. Thanks so much.